Uh, hey everyone, uh, welcome to Dependency Management with Composer, PHP Reinvented. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I am Neil Zatterman. Um, I am one of the uh, co-creators of Composer. Uh, and I also work in a number of other open source and free software. Um, one of them is uh, PHPBB, which I think uh, a lot of you have probably heard about at some point as well. Um, and uh, I work at Foramatic, and uh, Engine Yard is kind enough to sponsor some of my work on Composer these days, uh, as we've been trying to come to uh, some, uh, a point where we can uh, more spend more time on actually supporting this open source project. If, uh, start to help out of that as we're trying to come up with some ways of financing our, uh, the amount of time we end up spending on this project. Um, let me uh, start by uh, talking about you know, package management, dependency management, what is that even? Uh, you've, all of you have probably at least used a couple of these on the slide. You know, this is just different mechanism, different tools uh, used for uh, managing packages uh, managing software, managing libraries in different environments. Uh, you have like the standard Linux distro tools, but a lot of language environments come with some standard tool that's used to install packages on them. So I think nobody could think about uh, Node.js without thinking about NPM, those two kind of go hand in hand, for example. Um, and for a long time, uh, PHP had a couple of not quite so fun uh, tools to do similar things. Uh, I guess the oldest one of these, I mean, I've listed copy and paste there literally because that used, for, used to be for a very long time a way that people would actually install uh, libraries into their project. You know, download the zip file, stick it in there somewhere. Um, or maybe download the zip file, extract some directory from it because you don't want that whole project that's, you know, not offering individual packages but rather just just some huge monolithic uh, application. Um, you know, there was a time where Subversion was pretty popular uh, as VN externals was one of one of the things that was actually used quite widely in the PHP world. Uh, and there's always been pair. Um, I'm kind of curious, uh, just to make sure I'm kind of covering everything. Who here has used Composer before? All right, uh, that's pretty much everyone, okay. Uh, so the things I wasn't quite sure what to prepare for, so I'm gonna like jump through some of the introductory stuff a little faster, I think, with everyone doing that already. Um, and uh, who here has used pair? Uh, who here has done something other with pair than install PHP unit? All right, still a couple people, but a, a smaller amount of people. Uh, so I think one of the main issues with pair at the time was just that it was a little uh, complicated to use for anything other than those couple standard packages uh, available. Because uh, pair kind of describes lots of things at the same time, not just the installer that Composer is today, but uh, also the a particular library of uh, components and uh, as well as the protocol itself. Um, so how did Composer actually come about? And uh, I mentioned earlier that I, I work on PHPBB and we actually set out to build a new plugin system for the forum software. And uh, this was around the same time that we decided to start working on porting PHPB to Symfony or making more use of Symfony components. Symfony 2 was uh, just released as the first preview alpha release. Um, and we started talking to those people and kind of realized they had a lot of the same problems. And you know, if you think about it, uh, as I listed before, pretty much any software developer anywhere has this problem of having to install different software and trying to, uh, ins like, or rather trying to modularize, modularize uh, their software and having need, need some way to describe those dependencies between different packages. Uh, so rather than actually uh, build this plugin system, we ended up creating Composer. Oops, now that. Which didn't quite load. Ah, there we go. Reload helps. Uh, Composer consists of a number uh, of different parts. So you've all probably used the uh, the CLI2 Composer, which is just the thing that you install things with. Um, and the interesting part here is that uh, this is really a very thin CLI client on top of a library. Because as I was pointing out earlier, uh, we actually built this for PHPB to be a plugin system. Uh, so most of this functionality can actually be used uh, as a library without having to use the CLI tool. Uh, and more recently, we've started to see some uh, pretty interesting projects making use of this. Uh, certain pl uh, plugin uh, tools for uh, applications, like some block tool that installs plugins 
uh, making use of this without having the user actually use the Composer CLI tool, uh, but just making use of the library to install dependencies for a particular application. Um, and one thing that we uh, try to encourage with the CLI tool, and that we always like to uh, talk quite a bit about because I think this matters a lot more than what the tool itself does, is standards of interoperability between different PHP project packages. Because uh, sure, there's some tool to install all of these, but if they don't work well with each other, what's the point? Um, so we try to enforce certain standards that help interoperability, and I'll get into a couple of these uh, later on. Um, there's packages, which I'm sure if all of you have used Composer before, uh, you've seen before as well. This is just a open, uh, like it's open to anyone. Anyone can submit packages there. And it, the part that I want to point out here, because it will get a bit more interesting, is that the entirety of packages is based on this idea of feeding directly off of uh, VCS repositories. So there's no build process. There is no uploading packages to packages. There is no creating versions on packages. All of the information that you find on packages is automatically re read uh, from uh, composer configuration files on uh, the respective repositories. Um, there's status. I'm curious who of you have used status before. Like it's, all right, this is hopefully a smaller group of people because I'm going to explain how it actually works and how to use that. Um, so status is your way to host your own repository of packages. So if you don't use just those open source packages available on packages, but you have maybe your own private uh, packages on your own repository somewhere, um, or as uh, kind of interesting, if you're trying to proxy other Composer repositories. So if you don't want to rely on packages being available all the time, if you don't want to rely on the downloads being available from GitHub, you can actually use status uh, to download a partial copy of packages uh, that you use yourself. And if you're trying to install your own projects uh, using this, you are no longer required to rely on the availability uh, of our open repository. Um, and a little more interestingly, uh, a little newer is a torrent proxy. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we're trying to come up with some way of financing our sustained like involvement in Composer. Uh, and torrent proxy is a tool similar to Status, uh, a little nice, right, more, more user friendly in that it has a web user interface, uh, which makes it a little easier to do what I just mentioned, proxying packages, proxying uh, GitHub, uh, storing temporary copies of the information on there, uh, and publishing your own uh, private packages. Um, this is uh, open source, however, not in the free sense that we usually like to uh, think about. Uh, it is free for personal use. Um, however, we do ask uh, for commercial use to uh, pay for licenses of the software simply to support the uh, open source software. It does come with a full copy of the source code, which you can make modifications to. Um, so that's simply like a new tool that we offer in addition to status, with which, which is fully free and open source software, uh, with which makes a couple of these things just a little more user friendly. Um, so if you're interested in either of these, you might want to look at that as well if you have some commercial use for this. Uh, and another one I mentioned is uh, Composer installers. I'm actually not sure. I, this list I haven't updated in a while, so it's probably gotten even longer. And I think even when I created this originally, it wasn't quite this long yet. Uh, sorry, it was already longer than what's on there. Um, this is a number of projects that are quite widely used that uh, can all have their individual modules, plugins, is that are installed with Composer, even though they don't follow all of the standards for interoperability that we recommend, uh, using uh, specialized installation tools that know about the individual paths and uh, installation steps necessary for all of these tools. Uh, so even if you're using like any one of these and you'd like to automate some of the installation of plugins, modules for these, uh, you can use Composer for that. All right, so that was just a quick overview. Uh, I imagine most of you've heard about most of these before. Uh, you all said you use Composer before. I'll just jump through this real quickly. Um, there's the installer uh, that, like I, th I always like to point this out because it's a little curious. Uh, Composer isn't something that you usually just download a file of. Uh, it should, I hope this is like large enough for everyone to read. Seems a little small. 
Um, basically, you download a, an installer script and pipe this into PHP. And the background behind this is that we ship Compose as a FAR file. Uh, and we st there's still a number of configuration flags that make FAR files difficult or impossible to execute. Uh, and when this does happen, it doesn't give you any error information. Um, so we don't recommend that you just download a FAR file, but instead on a download page, we'll give you this little uh, piece of code to run on your shell to install Composer. But all it does is really download this file and check for those configuration settings to make sure that you can actually run Composer properly. Um, all right, you run Composer install. I think most of you would use Composer, so you've seen this before. Installs a bunch of packages. Uh, you end up with a vendor directory that contains all of these different folders. So this is the part that's different if you use any of the Composer installers, then rather than sticking it in there, it'll stick them in the respective directory that the particular project needs. Um, and this is what a Composer JSON looked like that defines the dependencies. And uh, kind of interestingly, this has to be in the uh, root directory of a project. Uh, this is a limitation that wasn't necessarily intended to stick around forever. This led to a little, uh, yep, I don't know, there's some interesting aspects like the Symfony framework that consists of a lot of components. The current standard way to have a single repository and uh, including a number of packages is actually to create uh, mirror repositories for each of them because you're still limited to having this composite JSON in the root directory of your repository. Uh, the upside of this is that it's a lot easier to uh, understand most uh, packages uh, in that they always follow the same uh, structure. Uh, so there's like an up and a downside to this. All right, so uh, here it gets a little more interesting. So even if you use Composer before, uh, I'm not sure that, like, I, I think I see a misconceptions about this a lot. A lot of people aren't entirely sure what these different files do. Uh, Composer JSON, everybody's kind of touched at some point to define what dependencies their project has. Um, and then you have this vendor directory that things end up in. But there's a step in between, which is the composer.log file. And the, it's a generated file that you don't touch yourself. It gets generated initially by running a composer update or install command. And as soon as it exists, uh, you can only update the log file using composer update. While the composer install command tries to install the contents of the log file. So there's these two key com uh, commands that Composer offers, update and install, and that's the relationship. Update goes from the JSON file to the log file and then runs an install, and install simply goes from the log file to the vendor directory. You can uh, use various options to influence the process of how the log file is updated specifically, and I'll get into these in, uh, a little later. Um, there's also a couple of relatively unknown ones that are pretty useful for certain situations. Uh, but the key part is really understanding this life cycle of running install whenever you're just trying to get whatever uh, dependencies the project has and running update if you're trying to actually change the versions of any of the dependencies. And the actual versions are documented in the log file while the uh, JSON file well, it simply defines a range of versions that the piece of software should be compatible with. The log file only applies to the project that you're working on. So if you're installing a library, the only thing that matters is the version constraints defined in the JSON file. Based on these, dependencies are resolved and your own project receives a log file that defines the precise versions of all of your dependencies. However, the log file is itself is only applied to the, the individual project that you're working on. Uh, so what's the point of all of this? Uh, well, first of all, please always commit this file into your VCS repository. I, I, I do realize that there's a bit of discussion over this. It's something that's been discussed in a lot of communities because this, like, this isn't our idea either. We just came from Bundler in the Ruby world. And there's really no downside to committing it. The result is, let's say you're working on a project with a team. All of you, if you run Composer install, get the exact same version of all dependencies. You don't just get any version that matches the constraint, but you get the exact same version. So if somebody published a small release for one of your dependencies, uh, this could result in some difference in behavior that you need to then uh, fix in your code. Um, but 
some coworker of yours might be trying to just get the project running and then for some reason they get this new version because they're installing it later than the person who checked in the log file, uh, sorry, who checked in composer JSON because they didn't check in a log file. And uh, consequently, uh, they end up having problems with their code simply because they have a different version of the same code. Um, so this process makes it very explicit when you want to switch to a different version. You have to explicitly run composer update and only one member of your team does this and then all other members of your team uh, have uh, those exact versions that all of you are working with, that all of you know that the tests run with. Um, the next step is uh, doing this across servers. If you're using Composer as part of your deployment process, then you want to make sure that all of your servers run the exact same versions of all dependencies. You don't want them to just run any of the versions that you think your software should be compatible with. You want to be certain that it runs the exact same versions. So again, the log file comes in to make sure that you install those specific versions rather than uh, anything that matches constraints. And again, if you're supplying an application to users, uh, all of those will have the same versions if they use Composer themselves to install dependencies. You have a question? Okay, it's good. This applies, would it also apply to libraries? Yes, it does. So this is the point that I was bringing up earlier. People always get confused over this because I, I did point out that the lock file is only useful to the project that you're working on. So if you're working on a, or if somebody publishes a library, why would they include the lock file in the library? Because it doesn't apply to the user of the library. But the user of the library is number three here. <coughs> number one and number two are still both interesting for libraries because there's a group of people working on a library and they all need to run tests. Now you want to be able to verify that a particular bug is based on a difference in versions. So if someone runs into, uh, doesn't use a log file, another user reports a bug against the library, you don't know whether this is the cause of a different version of a dependency being installed or a, a bug in your library. So instead, make sure that they all use the log file and then if you wanna run tests against a different version, use Composer Update to test that different version. And then part of the bug report is we made the following change to the log file and you can verify that the bug is actually part of this particular dependency change. So yes, even if you're working on a library, you should be committing your log file for other people working on the same library. Um, and the server part really applies only in so far as that it's interesting if you're using continuous integration. Uh, you kind of want the continuous integration service to uh, test your software with reliable versions that you know which they are. Uh, and you may, you may, as part of your uh, testing infrastructure, actually install different versions of your dependencies. I'll get to how to do that in a bit as well. Uh, but you do want to uh, be deterministic with this and you don't want to have random versions installed that you can't later verify actually caused or didn't cause issues. All right, next part that Composer does is uh, if I'm gonna in installs all of those uh, libraries uh, into the vendor directory and then part of your Composer JSON is an auto-loading section which makes use of PHP's auto-loading. Uh, and there's a new thing here uh, which is PSR4 uh, that replaces the old PSR0 auto-loading standard. Uh, PSR0 is this mapping of class names, uh, of namespaces and class names to directories and file names. And uh, in PSR4, uh, this has become a little simpler uh, because you can skip common prefixes within projects. Because what ended up happening is that you typically use a namespace of some company name slash the particular project, uh, backslash the particular project, backslash uh, this one component, backslash this subdirectory, backslash the actual class. So you end up with huge paths for everything, even though most of those directories contain exactly one subdirectory. So uh, the idea behind PSR4 is to simplify these directory structures. And uh, you can simply specify the uh, prefix namespace in your composer JSON and then uh, all of the classes in there are assumed to have this namespace as a prefix for them. Um, yeah, the autoloader ends up in vendor autoload PHP, and again, since most of you have used Composer, it's, you simply require this one file, and you can start using all the classes and all of your dependencies. And there is uh, a command to regenerate this autoloader, especially if you're using a uh, class map for some project that doesn't follow PSR zero up here so far. Uh, which means that you generate an explicit list of all the classes in the files or directories that you've listed. 
uh, then you will need this command uh, regularly to update this list if you add any new files. Um, and namely, there's uh, two options, no def and optimize, uh, that you should be running if you dump an auto loader for a production system. Uh, optimize generates such a class map for PSR0 and PSR4 auto loaded directories as well, which makes the lookup fast as it doesn't have to actually search for the files. And a no dev uh, excludes all development requirements uh, from the auto loader. So even if you do install development requirements, uh, this way you make sure that the, they are not being auto loaded and reducing the auto loader in size. <laughs> all right, so one of the standards that I said, and this is something that is, uh, I think is very important to me that a lot more developers take to heart, and that's why I wanna focus on this for a bit. Uh, is semantic versioning. Uh, semantic versioning is this concept of having uh, version numbers consisting of three digits, major release, minor release, and patch release, so something like 1.2.3, in which the patch release is exclusively for uh, bug fixes. The minor release should be incremented whenever you include new features. And every breaking API chain should include, uh, increase the major release. If authors of libraries strictly follow the standard, it makes it a lot easier for users of those libraries to require the correct versions and to uh, build, or to rather to define uh, future approved version constraints. Uh, so a couple easy, uh, just a walkthrough example of how this works. Uh, development version could be 0, 1, 0. Uh, you fix some bug in it, it's 0 0.11. Uh, you make some breaking changes. This is an exception because we're still on development mode 0 point, so the breaking changes simply lead to 0 0.20. Uh, and then you decide to make a stable release, so the first one is 1, 0, 0. Uh, you make some bug fixes, 1, 0, 1. Uh, some more fixes, 1, 0, 2. You include some new features, 1.1.0, 1 and then you make any breaking changes, and it's 2, 0, 0. All right, so that's how semantic versioning works. And now I wanna get a bit into the details of how to precisely pick versions in your Composer JSON. Um, there's a few pretty obvious ones. Uh, use exact match constraints, where you simply specify the particular version that you're looking for, uh, like any of these. Uh, you can uh, use ranges. Uh, simply use an asterisk in a place. So this would include simply 1.0 point any version, uh, two point anything. Um, all right, so next thing, you do have comparison operators in there, but please don't use just one of them in a version constraint. So if you're doing something like greater than or equal to 1.0, you're basically saying that your library is going to com be compatible with any future version of this particular package, and that's a very unlikely to be true statement. Uh, like, I, I, don't, I don't think I've ever heard a software that was compatible with any future version of another piece of software. Uh, so please feel free to use these operators, but combine them with others, yeah? And there's and and or operators for version constraints. Uh, if you can combine uh, two of these constraints, greater than or equal to with less than uh, using an and operator. And you can also use an or operator uh, if for some reason, you know, there's one particular release that was bad that your software is not compatible with, you could use two, cons two ranges and combine them with this. All right, so the more interesting operators, uh, and these are a little more tricky to understand, are uh, called next significant release operators. Uh, there's the tilde operator, which is the first one of these two. And if you write tilde 1.2, then this means uh, at least version 1.2, which expands to version 1.2.0, and then up to version 2.00. So if you're trying to describe a version constraint related to the semantic versions earlier on. So let's say I want to be compatible with all versions up until the next one breaking API, then you can use one of these operators to say that you'd be compatible with any new features, but you won't be compatible with any breaking changes. Um, and it gets a little more specific if you add 1.2.3, then this only goes up to 1.3.0. I know this isn't um, precisely what the semantic versioning defines anymore because this says I'm compatible with all uh, fixes, but I'm not compatible with a new feature, which is unlikely to be an issue. Um, so as of 
I think about uh, two months ago, uh, there's a new operator that more strictly adheres to the concept of semantic versioning. Uh, so for 1.2, it would work the same way, but for 1.2.3, it still only goes up to version two. So uh, the caret operator is kind of what you want to rely on if you know that your libraries that you're using are following semantic versioning, because you can specifically state that you will be compatible with any future releases until they make API breaking changes. So if you're building a library yourself, and that's when it's important what the constraints are, you should be using one of these two operators. Because if you're building an application that you're delivering to users, then your log file is important to make sure that users get the right versions. If you're building a library so that other users depend on your, on your constraints to match further dependencies they have, then please use these operators so that they don't end up with versions that don't actually work with each other. All right, um, the next part that influences which versions of which libraries you end up with is stabilities. So we have versions, you know, like the numbering, um, and there's composer stabilities uh, that are development, it's, it's kind of a flag for each release. It's a development mode release, it's an alpha release, a better release, an RC release, or a stable release. And these are automatically read. I think I brought this up earlier on, like packages as well as status, they all read this information from these respective VCS repositories. So the way that you make a release is by tagging it. Um, or even branches are available as versions in Composer. Um, so if you tag it, a 2.0.2 .2 would automatically be detected as a stable version. Uh, while if there's beta in there as a suffix, even with a number after it, it'll be detected as a better release. Um, similar thing happens with branches. Uh, we try to do this as automatically and as intuitively as possible. Um, if you have a branch called 2.0, uh, then the version we detect this as is 2.x dev. So it's a development release, uh, like any other branch. There's a master is usually available as dev slash ma uh, dev dash master. Uh, and the same applies to all other branches. So if you create any feature branch on your repository, these actually become available through installation with Composer. So this is pretty useful in development if you're trying to, um, you know, you like up, try out a new feature that you're working on in a library in your application, then you can actually require this particular branch that you're working on rather than having to tag a specific version and rely on this. Uh, now, on the requiring side, in your Composer JS, when you're trying to use any of these, uh, by default, uh, Composer comes with a minimum stability of stable. That means it will simply discard all versions that are not stable. Now, if you're trying to use any, any of these other stabilities, you can either simply increase your minimum stability, so let's say to beta in this example, uh, which means it will no longer discard beta or RC releases, uh, or you can set this to dev and it will simply use all releases available. And this will apply to, and all of your constraints will then apply to these releases. All right, so these are two separate concepts. Uh, first, it discards, release, uh, it discards particular versions, releases, and then it applies the constraints on these. Uh, however, you can also explicitly state um, the stability that you want for one particular package. So if you're saying, I would like to install this particular package in version 1.3 uh, or above, but I do want to include alpha releases, then you can use this add alpha flag in your composer JSON. Uh, or add beta as in the one below. And this is simply a suffix to add to the version constraint that you're defining in your composer JSON. Okay, so this is the way that you define all of your different dependencies. You make sure that you know, all of the version constraints match. And then you use composer update uh, to update your log file. And here's a couple of command line options that are interesting or good to know. Uh, first one is one that's probably still pretty common. If you're doing anything in production, use no dev to make sure that you're not installing any development requirements. Now the default is that you're installing development environments and that it prefers to install them from source, which means it will try, if, a, if possible, to install, to git clone, to SVN checkout, um, to give you a VCS repository for your dependencies so that you can actually go into this vendor directory, make changes to the files in there and commit them. 
So it's easier for you in development to work on a number of projects without having to each check, like check each of them out individually. This makes it uh, typically a little slower. Um, so in production, it is easier to use uh, prefer disk, which will try to download zip files uh, if available. Um, prefer stable uh, is an option that influences which versions get selected. Because like earlier, let's say we use a minimum stability of beta, and there's a better version for something available that's newer than a stable version that would also match our constraint, then this better version would be installed. If, however, we only want the better release to be used, if there is no stable version available, then we need to use prefer stable, which will use a stable version if available, but still allow for the better version to be installed if that is the minimum stability. Uh, the last two are pretty new options, uh, added only this in last month. Uh, prefer lowest will try to install the lowest available version matching your version constraints. And this is a really useful thing for testing because you're trying to ensure that your version constraints actually are still correct, that your software does still work with all of these old versions that you're listing in your version uh, constraints, uh, then you should be using prefer lowest as part of your testing to ensure uh, that your tests still run with all of these old versions. And the last one, in, uh, last one, ignore platform requirements, allows you to install a package even if the version constraints for PHP extensions, PHP itself, uh, don't match. Uh, which comes in handy if you have a project that runs on a particular setup that you maybe have a vagrant box for, but you just quickly want to run this one particular test that has nothing to do with all of these extensions on your local machine where you don't have the right versions of those extensions. So you can still install all of the dependencies without it failing for uh, missing extensions or unwritten of extensions. All right, so uh, as I promised earlier, I want to show you how to use status, and it's really straightforward. Uh, you simply use composers build and create project command or you check out the git repository directly. Uh, you end up with a copy of status uh, into which you put a, a file you can name however you want. The typical thing is to call a status JSON or config JSON. Um, and this contains a list of repositories. Similar to what you can do in composer JSON to define your own uh, VCS repositories to load packages from, your a status configuration file contains a list of uh, repositories that you would like to load packages from. And uh, the default behavior is actually require all of explicitly written here, which means that all the packages that can find in any of these repositories will be published on your status repository. The alternative down here is that you explicitly list certain versions that you are interested in publishing on your repository uh, using require similar to composer JSON. Uh, so in this case, uh, package package two would have all of their versions published, but package three would only publish version two zero zero. Um, further, in this configuration, you can use the archive command. Uh, so by default, status looks at these repositories, generates the metadata so that your composer install can make use of this metadata, but the download will still go directly to the VCS repositories that you listed. Uh, now, if you want to actually build tar files. Uh, for these versions uh, and have them downloaded over HTTP rather than always having to clone that Git repository, uh, you can use the archive command so that status will automatically also build all of the different packages for the versions that you need. Um, the prefix URL is the, uh, is the URL under which those packages will later be available. So uh, status will dump these into a local directory and then you need to make sure that this is available under this URL so that users of the repository can actually reach these packages. Uh, and the skip dev uh, option, the last one there, uh, simply allows you to uh, skip over branches when building packages so that branches are always installed from uh, the repository. Uh, and then building it is simply a call to the bin status script that's included in status uh, with the directory that you're trying to build into, which is web in this case, and then you make sure that this is available over your web server. You can also serve this over SSH. You can uh, really through anything that you like. Uh, just make sure that it's somehow reachable. Uh, and then on the other side, in your composer JSON, you include a custom repository of the type composer. A uh, composer repository is really just a JSON file listing all of these packages, uh, for example, like just status generated uh, at a particular URL. 
So I'll tell you p.example.org. Uh, or if you want to make this available system-wide to all of your packages uh, or project that you work on, uh, you can actually use Compose's config file, uh, which is in, I think it's a little too small, in, do in your home directory .composer slash config.json uh, or on Windows and this other file that you can look up on the slides later. It's a little long. Uh, and you can just list the uh, repository that you like to use in there and then all of your uh, projects on your system will load dependencies from this repository. So it's pretty straightforward, let's say, in, your, in a company that you're working at to set up a repository like this for everyone to use without a lot of hassle, uh, without having to manually specify all these repositories. All right, so there's another part to the, talk of, uh, to the title of my talk, which was PHP reinvented. I know, like, so far this was just, you know, lots of composer stuff, how does all of this work? Uh, and I think there was a couple talks today already, so I tried to, like, I shortened this part a little bit, uh, that covered both uh, all the new developments and, like, how PHP uh, is being written, how these projects are laid out, uh, what kind of new things are happening in the language. Uh, but I do want to briefly touch on this. Uh, I mean, the first thing we can definitely say, this is like PHP uh, dependency management reinvented, like quite obviously Composer is a new tool. Um, and I think the, the most important point of what Composer has changed and how people approach dependencies in PHP projects is that we no longer have a tool that you use to make state changes. So let's say with pair you install a particular package. Even if you do this manually, download the, uh, some zip file, exp exp uh, exp sorry, extracted, um, and then you have it there. Um, you have, you had processes that change the state of your project. But now instead you have the composer JSON file in which you define the overall system state that you're trying to reach. And the composer JSON and how you manipulate it has nothing to do with the current state of the system. It doesn't matter what's currently in your vendor directory, you're simply defining a state that you would like all of your dependencies to be in. And then you have a tool that ensures that the state actually matches this description. Um, so the, the, pr the overall process how this works has changed. And if this sounds a little familiar to you, this is the same thing that uh, tools like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, Salt have been doing for uh, server, configuration, uh, server management, server configuration management. Um, it's a, a process that's become a lot more commonly used because it's easier to reproduce, more predictable. And uh, I think this has helped uh, PHP to uh, make use of this a lot more because it does make the whole concept more approachable, more easy to use. Uh, and you can see this if you look at some of the statistics. So this is uh, the statistics we publish on packages. Uh, you don't have to read the numbers up there. It's just you see the graph and how it expands. Uh, we have over 50,000 PHP packages available on packages today. So you know, if, you're, if you're looking for something, probably on there already. If you're trying to build something new, maybe take a look because it's probably on there already. Uh, there's over 200,000 versions of these packages. We have reached a point of over 50 million installations per month uh, of individual packages. Um, so the PHP world has been taken by storm by this concept of being able to install their dependencies in such a predictable uh, and easy way. All right, so let's get back to like PHP reinvented. And I think there's a couple goals that people had in PHP projects for a long time. And this is you know, making APIs simple, easy, easily approachable, uh, improving code quality, uh, and having a large amount of modularity, visibility uh, of individual components of the code. Uh, and some of the like programming, software engineering methods of achieving these are you know, better separation of concerns. Uh, dependency injection is something that's become really popular in the PHP world to make it possible to decouple individual components. Uh, things like events make it possible uh, to interact between components without strongly coupling them. Uh, and the yeah, designing software with testability in mind uh, leads to a very similar uh, decoupling component, creation of components. And we have these software engineering processes or methods on one side, and we have Composer on the other side as a tool that allows you to now actually package up these individual components 
so that you no longer have to do this as part of one massive code base, but you can actually do it as individual packages. Uh, and the result of this is a series of new frameworks. You know, Symfony 2 was at the very beginning of this process. Uh, things like Laravel is Silex. Something like Silex wasn't previously easily possible with PHP. Um, it simply makes use of a number of these components of one of the existing frameworks to build a new framework. Yeah, so it's really easy now to just create a new framework based on a small part of another one because you can easily take all of those individual parts when previously it would have been a hard job to even separate these things. So the combination of all of these uh, engineering changes of all the, the different methodology that people use to program PHP to build more maintainable, more component-based software goes hand in hand with the possibility of actually using these as individual packages. Uh, we have a lot more single-purpose libraries. Right? No longer all just big applications that do everything, but we have a lot of small libraries which do particular specific things like a static guzzle, like an HTTP client monologue logging library, and uh, that helps you in creating new applications, making use of these individual tools for specific things that you're trying to do. And overall, all of this has led to a, I'd say, a faster innovation cycle. And this is something you notice in PHP overall. Uh, I do think that all of these changes are interlinked. They, they, they led to a faster development of the language. Um, there's a lot of factors into that, but I think that the uh, increase in speed of new projects, new ideas, and how fast you can build them based on existing code um, has also led to changes to the overall environment in which PHP is written uh, to the language itself even. So this is kind of what I'd like you to do from now on when you're trying to work on a new project. The uh, first thing is look around. What's out there already? Uh, isn't there maybe something that already solves part of my problem? And then try to not address all of these problems at the same time, but write some of these single-purpose libraries. Solve one particular problem that you'd like to work on and publish this one particular small single-purpose library afterwards. And then Others can reuse the work that you've put into this just as you reuse their work. And through this process, we will further increase this innovation time. We will reinvigorate PHP. Uh, there's a couple links that if you want to find out more, get Composer.org is the Composer documentation, packages.org I mentioned earlier. Uh, you find all of the code for Composer projects on GitHub. Um, there's some uh, Google groups for discussion uh, for users or development. Uh, and there's also two RSC channels that you can find uh, help on or discuss things surrounding Composer. Uh, thank you, everyone. All right, I think we have roughly five minutes for Q&A. Um, and you can also find me on Twitter and at Naderman if you want to ask more questions afterwards. I think there's one just here. Uh, do we have mics for them, or should I repeat the, okay. Uh, so he's saying there's a, uh, Rev has a package that doesn't actually contain any code, but simply conflicts with a lot of versions. And the purpose of this is to uh, conflict with insecure versions of various software. So if you make sure that you install this package, you'll have a conflict with any version of a package that has a um, security issue. Um, I actually wasn't aware of this, but it seems like a very uh, straightforward way of uh, doing this if the individual uh, package maintainers, uh, you use that library, don't update their dependencies fast enough. Um, you can obviously do this yourself, as in like blacklist versions you don't want to have installed, but I think that's probably a pretty good approach. Yeah? What's the name of the package? I think it's the row, as a R O A V E okay. slash. Okay, uh, that's the organization. Just look at R O A V E, it's like security something or other. Okay. All right. <laughs> Uh, there's a question back there. All right, check it. Okay, so uh, the question is, is there a way to find out who is using your, uh, your library uh, through packages API? Um, so use in the sense of who's using as an installing, obviously not, because we don't want people to you know, find out who you are. However, 
Um, if you yourself, well, there's two aspects to this. Compose itself actually comes with a command now that can let you know uh, the dependencies of a package or rather, on, and the inverse dependencies. So you can check what depends on this particular package, which makes use of packages API to give you this information. Um, there's also a website called uh, versioni.com, uh, which has a lot of information about packages that simply uses packages and graphically displays this, uh, where you can see which other uh, open source packages depend on this package that you're looking at. Uh, I do think there's like two or three other projects that try to graph some of the information on packages. Unfortunately, I don't know the names off the top of my head, uh, but you can certainly find some of these. Uh, but yeah, there's a couple ways to do that. All right, uh, for the questions, all the way in the back. All right, so his point was, uh, as I said, uh, packages is growing and growing, but he said like his projects and his dependencies are too. So he ends up with a composer JSON file that has more and more packages, and this becomes a little difficult to maintain as well. Um, and yes, you actually suggested the answer. Um, you can create meta packages. So a composer JSON, uh, if you're publishing a package, has a type that defaults the library. And there's actually another type called meta. That means that you don't have to, it doesn't contain any source code, it's simply a, description of a package, and then this package can have a requirement on a list of packages that somehow logically belong together. Um, so, I don't know, maybe I'd have my typical web app package that includes like the framework I wanna use, like the template engine I'm using with that, and a couple other things. And then in my projects, I simply require this meta package, which then has requirements to all the uh, individual packages that I need. And through that, I can actually consolidate uh, groups of packages or dependencies into uh, individual composer packages. All right, any further questions? This is one with the red t-shirt. Okay. Uh-huh. There's, uh, okay, so he's bringing up two, uh, two issues uh, with, that he sees with Composer, and I think this is like a typical perspective of, I don't know, I imagine, do you maybe work on one of these distributions uh, package managers, or are you like maintaining, so, okay. Um, so the, the first one was, uh, sorry, no, I forgot about the first one, I'm thinking about the second one too much. Uh, signing, all right, uh, so Composer doesn't have any signing currently. Um, uh, yes, it doesn't, and yes, we do actually intend to change that, however, um, all of the traffic runs through SSL. So you are limited in uh, what can happen to attacks on typically two, like basically if packages does get hacked, then you're vulnerable to that because you don't have signing. Um, and if GitHub, because most of this relies on GitHub gets hacked, you uh, have these issues. Uh, if GitHub does get hacked, then there's a lot of issues, <laughs> I think. So that, that, that's one of these that we're kind of ignoring for the moment. Um, you're absolutely right that packages is kind of a, I don't know, like a single point of failure from a security perspective. Uh, and we do want to include signing at some point. Um, there is, this makes things very difficult for us because the upside we currently have with packages is that we can directly uh, let people download stuff from GitHub. And they offer, for example, the zip archives for all their tags, uh, which aren't signed, even if you assign the uh, git commit that you tagged uh, and that then gets built into a package. 
So for us to uh, be able to offer signing of packages, we'd actually have to build all packages for all of these open source projects on packages to actually or like have them uploaded. And uh, we haven't quite figured out how to do that in a somewhat sane and just as easy to use way yet. Um, and this, the second part uh, is actually somewhat related to this is that Composer handles dependencies per application. And that is the very purpose of Composer is we don't want to do system dependencies with this. The, the purpose of Composer is to build a application, like the resulting uh, product is something that I would install through a distributions uh, package manager. But this is purely for developers and it is not designed uh, to install uh, just one instance of a particular piece of code. The, the very idea of, co of Composer is to manage dependencies of one project within that directory, have it self-contained. And so yes, I understand this is not what you're trying to do, but that is a very intentional decision to do that, that this way. Uh, all right, I think there's one more question down here. Um, so the question was which, kind, which so other software inspired is mostly while building Composer? Uh, and, the co and this is actually a number, there isn't one particular one. Uh, it all started with me starting to work on the dependency solver itself, uh, which is based on the set solver in libzipper, which gets used to install RPMs on OpenSUSE these days. Um, so that's how we resolve all of these version constraints and how we figure out which versions of which dependencies to install. Um, then a lot of the uh, configuration files like the composer JSON and how all of this looks is inspired by NPM's configuration files uh, from the Node.js world. Uh, the lock file is an idea we have from Bundler in the Ruby world. So Bundler is a tool on top of Ruby gems, uh, which makes which turns gems, which is another one of these tools where you you install a package where you have inter like processes to make changes into one of these where you describe a state. So with Bundler. You describe the state and, uh, state and gem is being used to inst actually make those changes. Um, so I think maybe those three, but there's definitely influence from others as well. Awesome. I think, I think we're done with time. If you do have some more questions, come see me here before I leave. <laughs>